few things in Zimbabwe are as they seem. A country led by a man who rails against the British, but wears suits tailored in London's Savile Row. A country ruled by a Marxist party that fought for 20 years against the injustice of colonial rule, and then spent the next 30 using the same laws to crush dissent. A country with a government of national unity consisting of two parties that agree on little but their mutual dislike. People know who are the true representatives of their interests, of their permanent interests. They know. People have opened up their eyes to the animal that MDC is, which is just a puppet. Can you trust Zanopiev? Uh, this is the party that has engineered and authored a genocide in Matebeleland. This is the party that almost killed us. 30 years after its struggle for independence, Zimbabwe is still at war. Is this what you're trying to do, bring violence? Fighting over land. This Zimbabwe is for black people, not for white. Fighting over diamonds. Alluvial diamonds in Africa have never failed to cause a war. There are no exceptions. And fighting over power. ZANU PF is not willing to share power with the MDC. It was only in 2008 that Zimbabwe's economy had basically collapsed. The national currency was entirely worthless. In rural areas, people were starving, and the healthcare system had just broken down. Dead bodies were piling up in mortuaries. For ordinary Zimbabweans, the country had just stopped functioning. Two years on, Zimbabwe seems a very different place, at least if your view is from the heart of its steel and glass capital, Harare. But if you travel a mile or so from the city centre, you find a different reality. Even more so if you go a mile or two further still to the satellite towns which once fed workers into one of the strongest economies in Africa. What has changed, at least in theory, is the government. Since independence from Britain in 1980, Zimbabwe has been ruled by one party, the Zimbabwe African National Union Patriotic Front, or ZANU-PF, and one man, Comrade Robert Gabriel Mugabe. But in the 2008 election, this dominance appeared to have come to an end. The opposition movements for democratic change won the majority of seats in parliament, and its leader, Morgan Changarai, claimed victory in the presidential vote, despite official results giving him less than the 50% he needed to win outright. We know that we won 57%, and that Mugabe had over 33%. However, the outcome has been manipulated, and the result was that we needed to go for a second runoff. What then transpired was that uh, there was a rollout program by the army to intimidate uh, voters uh, on behalf of Zanpia, on behalf of President Mugabe. According to the UN, 190 MDC supporters died in the ensuing violence. 5,000 more were injured and tens of thousands displaced. Morgan Changarai refused to enter the presidential runoff unless security could be guaranteed. For us, it was a declaration of war. And if there was going to be a declaration of war, and we were talking about elections, we said, no, if we are going to declare war, we will not be part of that war machine. Do you, looking back on that, think it was a political mistake, or do you think it was the right one? It was the right decision to take, because uh, the amount of violence was totally unprecedented. And what's the use if it is just a contestation of power and not to seek the mandate of the people? What is it worth? What is any Zimbabwean's life worth to fight for? Just to be in power. 
Perhaps unsurprisingly, ZANU PF takes a very different view. Although he failed to win his own seat in the election, Patrick Chinimasa remains Justice Minister and a member of ZANU's all powerful Politburo. The truth of the matter is that there was inter party violence between ZANU PF supporters and MDCT supporters. That violence was there. And no one is free of blame. But because the MDC is the darling of the West, of their media, and because they are pushing an agenda for a regime change, the international community was ready to accept any nonsense that they got from MDC. What's the thinking within ZANU-PF about the way forward? Because even as the president himself has admitted, said it openly, that in 2008, the Zimbabweans voted in larger numbers for the MDC than they did for ZANU-PF. Yes, that no, no, that is not true. That they is not voted true. for the opposition leader. No, 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 that is not true. Let me put it correctly. ZANU-PF got 47.6% of the electorate support. MDC 44.6%. But the presidential elections, it was quite clear that he said that... He, he was in the lead, but the rules were very clear. You must get 50% plus one. And he didn't get 50% plus one. So he didn't want the embarrassment of losing. Then within just a few days, two days or three days of the poll, he decides to, 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 to pull out and he gives the pretext of violations of this, violations of that. Those were just a facade. With Changarai having withdrawn, the second round of the presidential election was somewhat quieter than the first. Two days later, with words that must have seemed very familiar, the president swore himself in for the fifth time. Who serve Zimbabwe in the office of president. So help me God. But the pomp and ceremony could not disguise Mugabe's lack of support. And within months, Morgan Changarai's MDC was invited to share power, at least on paper. Under the so-called Global Political Agreement, or GPA, Changarai was appointed prime minister, while Mugabe remained president. And the optimistically titled Government of National Unity was born. I do swear that I will be faithful and bear true allegiance to Zimbabwe. So help me God. I mean, having won an election to be forced to go into a coalition, you can find it. It's very difficult to accept that. But uh, we have not entered this coalition lightly. Uh, in fact, I would easily have stayed out and say, let them sort out their own failed policy mess. Uh, but for the sake of the people, I'm more motivated about what collectively we can contribute to rescue the country from almost an obvious precipice. But Zimbabwe had, in many respects, already gone over the precipice. In most countries around the world, if you picked a banknote up off the floor, you'd think it was your lucky day. Well, imagine if you, like me, had picked up a $50 million note. Well, if you're in Zimbabwe, you wouldn't be so happy because these notes are completely worthless. In fact, so worthless that you find them lying all over the floor like bits of rubbish. The national currency is part of what defines a state. At independence in 1980, the Zimbabwean dollar was worth approximately the same as its US counterpart. By 2008, it was worth 50 billion times less, with an official inflation rate of 231 million percent. The unity government's answer has been to abandon their currency in favor of the US dollar and the South African rand. The shops may be full again and petrol available, but this doesn't help the more than 80% of Zimbabweans who are unemployed. Shinga, Shandi, Shinga! Shinga! Even for those in work, dollarization has not solved their problems. Viva the working class people of the Republic of Zimbabwe! Viva! Viva! This 
this demonstration today isn't being held by opponents of the government, it's actually being held by people who work for the government, civil servants who feel that their rights and their economic conditions need to be addressed. With monthly salaries of over 150 US dollars, they are amongst the best paid in the country, not counting the politicians, of course. But even they are struggling. People are earning $150, but we are getting water bills, electricity bills, as well as phone bills beyond $400. We are making basic minimum demands around survival. The residents of Zimbabwe's capital only have to look up to be reminded of where all the money has gone. The now empty reserve bank dominates every angle of Harare skyline, and its governor, Dr. Gideon Gono, remains in his job, despite the MDC's demand that he be sacked. It was under his watch that the Zimbabwe um, dollar collapsed totally because he just kept on printing money. We got into a hyperinflationary situation which effectively ruined the economy. But he is Robert Mugabe's blue-eyed boy. There are even suspicions that uh, a lot of the wealth that uh, Mugabe now holds, including his wife's farm, uh, was acquired because Gideon Gono was uh, willing to facilitate. ZANU-PF offers an altogether different explanation for the economic collapse, what they call sanctions, but the international community calls travel bans and restrictions on the ZANU-PF elite. They argue that the hundreds of millions given in aid by international donors in the last decade are a smokescreen, hiding their true intentions. They impose sanctions so that it disrupts our economic, the flow of economic activity, and then they come to take credit as donors. But then why not just turn them away? Sorry, but, but why can't they lift the sanctions? If we were left to manage our affairs, free from external interference, we'll be able basically to, to be on our feet and run. We have the capacity to do that, notwithstanding the hiccups that we may have been encountered over the past 10 years. There are few countries in the world where an inflation rate of 231 million percent could be described as a hiccup. But ZANU-PF has not survived 30 years in power by accepting defeat when events have turned against it. The global political agreement between ZANU-PF and the MDC promises justice, reconciliation and, crucially, a new constitution to decide where power will lie. But as the MDC inevitably think their prime minister should be in control and ZANU-PF their president, progress is slow. Across the country, groups are meeting, ostensibly to discuss this new constitution, but in practice, to hear each party's vision for a new Zimbabwe. It is very clear to me that the MDC is a party that was specifically and specially created to achieve a certain purpose. It's a special vehicle. It was created specifically to fight for the rights of white commercial farmers and then use any other grievances that black people have against Zanupia as a secondary thing. He seems to know the MDC better than I do. <laughs> he even seems to know the origins of the MDC, uh, no matter how misplaced those origins are. <laughs> they have such an inferiority complex about themselves that they think it's only white men who is capable of coming up with brilliant ideas. <laughs> it is possible that brilliant ideas emerge from our own Zimbabweans don't suspect that there is any white man behind. I don't want democracy and the standards of human rights and the, and the democracy that are decided on by Western people, by white people. Listening to ZANU-PF talk today, you would think that this was a country where whites were not welcome, but there are still plenty of white Zimbabweans living a life that, on the surface, appears not so different from the past. Sunday afternoon in Salisbury, but skin colour has never really been the issue. 
At independence, Robert Mugabe went to great lengths to reassure the less than 2% white population that Zimbabwe would be their country too. If yesterday you hated me, today you cannot avoid the love that binds you to me and me to you. He didn't have an ideological problem with whites as long as his own political base was intact, was not threatened. The white commercial farmers continued to hold these vast pieces of land. They had unbelievable amounts of wealth. In fact, people used to say, when will this independence end so that we, blacks, indigenous people, can also benefit from it? The whites were a commercial asset, but politically irrelevant. Zanu PF held one million. Power, not skin color, has been the dominant theme of Zimbabwe's politics since independence. And inevitably, it was the people who did not vote for Zanu PF in the 1980 elections that first found themselves on the wrong side of Robert Mugabe. Bulawayo is the main town in the area called Matabililand. And traditionally, Matabililand has been very different politically and tribally from the heartlands that ZANU has drawn its support. Once a hub of transport and industry, Bulawayo has stagnated over the last 30 years. At independence, Matabililand's minority and Bele people had their own freedom fighters, PF Zapu led by Joshua Nkomo. But Zapu did poorly in the 1980 election, and Nkomo had little choice but to join Mugabe's government while his Zapu fighters were absorbed into the new national army. But it was to be an uneasy alliance. They were the best trained, and yet they were always given lower ranks. And at the end of the day, they were frustrated to the point of getting them to abandon the army, most of them left the army in disgruntlement. But many kept their weapons, and Zapu was now clearly a threat, one which Mugabe moved swiftly to eliminate. After independence, he had created the 5th Brigade, a unit answerable directly to him and trained by North Korea. And in 1982, they were unleashed on Nkomo supporters. You will realize that the people of Matebele land were completely defenseless against the 5th Brigade and their Korean uh, commanders that were operating in Matebele land. And our people were being slaughtered in their hundreds. No official inquiry has ever been carried out in Matebele land, but local NGOs have put the death toll as high as 20,000. Yet the world looked away. When the atrocities took place, not one single Western country ever raised a voice against what was happening in this country. Zapu was effectively destroyed as a political force and swallowed by ZANU in 1987, becoming ZANU-PF. Mugabe merged his job of prime minister with that of president. One man ruling one party, ruling a country. The 1990s saw a steady process of economic decline, exacerbated, critics say, by the corruption inherent in a one-party state. And not even the foot soldiers of the liberation struggle remained untouched. In 1997, the War Veterans Compensation Fund was suspended amid allegations that senior politicians had looted 450 million US dollars intended for the heroes of independence. The war veterans were saying, we fought for this country, we liberated it, it's almost two decades down the road, we have nothing. Did they actually confront Mugabe? They did, physically, right at State House. They marched there, the people who should have stopped them, the army, the police, were part of them because they were largely, mainly war veterans themselves. So what happened? They insisted, we made you president, we can unmake you, we can replace you with someone else. And Robert Mugabe had to concede defeat and to agree to pay the war veterans 
50,000 Zimbabwe dollars each and 2,000 per month for the rest of their lives. It was something that had never been done. It was not budgeted for. The impact on the economy was devastating. We call it Black Friday, 14th November. The Zimbabwe dollar collapsed by something like 60 to 70 percent. The war veterans had been appeased at the cost of the rest of the population. With 60% now living below the poverty line, those outside the ZANU-PF inner circle took their struggle onto the streets. We are not supposed to take our money from tax to pay the ex-combatants on the levy. We are suffering, they must get their money from somewhere, not from us. The trade unions spoke for ordinary Zimbabweans who found themselves losing their jobs and facing increasing food prices and unprecedented police brutality. One trade union leader in particular began to make his voice heard. Workers of Zimbabwe don't be caught on the wrong foot of violence on the streets. ZANU-PF was under attack and it gambled. It offered a new constitution in 1999, which, in return for cementing presidential powers, promised to redistribute white-owned farmland. With the economy in seemingly terminal decline, white commercial farmers and black trade unionists found common cause against the new constitution. And from this, the MDC was born. On the 13th of February 2000, the constitution was rejected by 55%, Mugabe's first defeat. Two weeks later, the land invasion started. Now, because he had paid the war veterans and monthly allowance, allowances from 98, he told them, you have to invade the farms. And if you invade the farms, we will take the land. And the war veterans said, 20% of all the land we will take will be ours. And Robert Mugabe said, no problem. And so they started on the uh, violent uh, land reform program, which we call, you know, farm invasion. We will remain here till we die. Jabulani Sibanda, the chairman of the War Veterans Association, denies that they have any political affiliation and insists that their actions were the writing of colonial wrongs. The land issue was addressed in that constitution. And again, the white settler, the British white settler, they found that there was now a problem in the new constitution. This is where they were exposed. They took all the benches that they had, assisted some renegades amongst our black community, hungry people that could be bought by money, and they organized a no vote. You talk about the MDC. I'm yeah, yeah, yeah. It was during its formation. When the new constitution was, was crushed down with the no vote, the war veterans now saw that the route to complete freedom of, 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 of our nation is not over. Like Zapu before them, the white farmers had underestimated the repercussions of challenging the power of ZANU-PF. Land is an emotive issue in Zimbabwe. The white settlers came for minerals in the 1880s, but then stayed for land. Under increasingly repressive laws, they carved up the country for themselves, creating what were, in essence, reservations for the black population. After independence in 1980, the situation remained largely unchanged. But up until the farm invasions began in the year 2000, Agriculture was also Zimbabwe's most important industry, employing half a million people and accounting directly for 40% of its exports. Today, Zimbabwe is reliant on food aid. 
It's a measure of the precariousness of the food situation in the country as well as the resourcefulness of ordinary Zimbabweans that on grass verges all over Harare you find maize having been planted so that people can feed themselves and their families. The Commercial Farmers Union, once one of the most powerful organizations in the country, remains, but the industry it supported is in tatters. At independence, you could see that it, everything was positive. Yeah. The only negatives when land, land re reform started. So has land reform been a success? Let this picture tell a story. The government of national unity was meant to restore the rule of law, but the CFU's remaining members have seen little change. It hasn't stopped. It's, 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 if anything, since the signing of, of, of the global political agreement between the two parties, it's escalated. So are farm seizures still going on Absolutely. now in 2010? Absolutely. Um, since Christmas, we've had, I think, eight farmers kicked off their, their land again. And not legally, illegally. The person would come to you and tell you, I, this farm has been allocated to me, I'm, not, I'm now the new owner and you need to leave. When you say, hang on, <laughs> this procedures to be followed, this is not the way it should happen. And then 30, 40, 50 um, thugs are hired and they come and literally force you off. When you contact the police and say, but the, this is what's happening, they say it's political, we cannot interfere. And I'm talking of today, not even yesterday. That is what is happening right now. If you're politically, politically connected somehow, you can get a farm, no problem. It's not just ZANU-PF bigwigs and local party officials who have taken much of the properties belonging to the white commercial farmers who have benefited from the land reform program. There are also small-scale farmers who are given their own little plots of land. Small-scale farming provides the opportunity for many to own their own land. But inevitably, economies of scale make them commercially far less profitable than the large farms they replaced. This is the homestead. I put about 10 hectares of maize every year. Right. And the average yields, because of the hardships, the average yields is about five tons per hectare. Has it transformed the life of your family, your children? Very much. Have you seen my mumbis, the kettle? I can hear them. <laughs> I, have, I have the good the kettle. There are about 46 of them. Despite being a beneficiary of the land reform program, Shepherd still blames the former landowners for the country's failure to feed itself. The white farmers hid the farms, hid the wealth of the country. Yes, the money in the banks. So they hold their money in the banks. The banks, they are reluctant to give us money, they to give us loan for the new farmers. Rod Swales is one of those former owners. He lost his farm in 2002 and argues that the problem with land reform lies in the fact that the process was politically motivated, which led to farms being seized, stripped and abandoned. Flying over the area where he used to farm, there seems some evidence to support this. Um, having orbited, we've noticed that all the barn roofs on one section have all been removed. That's obviously a an old field there, it's actually reverting to bush. I don't see any crops uh, under production there either, which totally belies the fact that land was the issue. The sole motive for, for the land exercise was Zana PF's last political card um, in retaining power. I mean, is it just about having lost your particular farm and, and your asset, or does it go any deeper than that? I have no roots anywhere else. Um, I am part of Africa. I was a provider, I was an employer. Um, I think that we did a lot more good than bad for the people of this country. But that's the, where the war vets yeah. set up their yeah. huts. Yeah. Roy Bennett, who farmed in Chimani Mani, was elected as an MP by his predominantly black community in 2000. From that day to this day, just suffered the most tremendous persecution. Everything I owned was taken from me. Uh, my, one of the most difficult things were is that um, I had a very, very strong working relationship with my employees. Uh, they rallied very strongly behind me. Um, uh, two of my employees were shot. Three of my employees' daughters were raped. And basically I held their bodies in my hands. And um, my 
home was was torched. So, but this went on for, 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 for weeks or oh months? yes, yeah. For for from 2000 after I was I won the the parliamentary seat until 2004 when the military moved on and moved me off completely. In fact, we started our life again with a suitcase. Perhaps the most controversial area of the land reform program has been the transfer of farms like Bennett's, not to groups of new farmers, but to individuals, mainly, if not exclusively, party loyalists. Among the beneficiaries have been ZANU-PF politicians, generals and judges. Only 1% of former agricultural workers have received any part of the land they worked so hard on. Uh, on the western side, actually, we run down again, actually, to the river. Right. Matty, as he likes to be called, who describes himself as no more than a local ZANU representative, took over his farm in 2002 from its former white owner. It was a historic wrong being righted. Came here actually coming from a poverty-stricken living and life. 2002 up to 2009, you call it maybe about eight years. There was not one year that I did not produce a thousand plus tons of maize every year. Do you have any sympathy, given how strong your feelings are for this land? For a white farmer who has equally as strong feelings, can you understand what it must be like, the catastrophe of being told to leave your land? When you tell a person the truth, you will understand. Because at one time he asked me, how can you say you've been allocated this land when I've got a title deed? And I told him, fine, you've got a paper. If you look closely on that paper, you will find a stamp of this government on your paper. And I don't have no title deed. My skin and the soil is one. And that's my title. Land ownership on the basis of ethnicity is a long way from the picture that Mugabe painted at independence. And many of those who believed in the new Zimbabwe now find themselves stranded in Harare. No farms to go back to and no home but Africa. My family have been here for over 200 years. If I am not an African, what the hell am I? I want to go home because that farm that I bought with a certificate of no further interest and that party that I fought for to be able to change the perception of the Zonu PF government said to me, if you fight this war for me and with me and help me finance it, I will make sure that you go home. But in real terms, the white farmers have been forgotten. Their workers have been driven off the farms, adding to the ranks of the homeless, the unemployed, and the diaspora of more than three million Zimbabweans now working abroad. The land reforms are here to stay, but did the ends justify the means? The land pattern that existed in 2000 was unacceptable. You couldn't have uh, uh, 4,000 people, 4,700 people, uh, less than 1% of your population, uh, owning 15 million hectares of uh, your country's best land. Our major point is that uh, the, the acquisitions that took place after 2000 were political. These guys had 20 years to do it, from 1980 to 2000. So I have no doubt in my mind that uh, what drove the acquisitions was not the need for genuine land balance, but politics, because these guys have lost, lost the referendum. After independence, land reform was governed by the Lancaster House Agreement, under which Britain agreed to pay half the cost of resettling new farmers on underutilized land. By 1994, it had contributed over 44 million British pounds, but cancelled the programme because it argued the land was going to powerful politicians and not landless peasants. In 1997, we have a letter from a minister in the Blair government saying they will not meet the commitments. When we emphasised that we were going ahead with or without their money, and this basically precipitated what, we, what then happened from 2000. The decision who should get the land is a Zimbabwean decision, not a, a British one, not a European or an American. 
It's us who decide which people should be beneficiaries of the land issue. Take your people out the yard, please, Mr. Kononga. Yes, Is this what you're trying to do, bring violence? Whatever the reasons, the politicizing of the land issue has reintroduced an element into Zimbabwean politics that may be hard to remove. This Zimbabwe is for black people, not for white. Well, racism has had such a destructive force. And for us now to be going back, you know, we, we were over that. We, we were over this racial thing. We were finding a way forward. And now, at this late stage in 2010, what do we find? We're back into that groove again, where, where race plays such a huge role. And it's so destructive. The 2008 election still seems a very recent memory in Zimbabwe. The next election is perilously close for the country's voters, perhaps as soon as 2011. The global political agreement remains little more than a piece of paper. While South African President Jacob Zuma tries to calm the waters, beneath the surface, his ANC party is reluctant to push too hard against its former brothers in arms. I'm very encouraged by the spirit of cooperation displayed by the leaders and all the parties. There is no liberation movement or liberation political party in Southern Africa which has actually ended over power. Their DNA simply doesn't allow them to hand over power to civilian political parties. The GPA is meant to ensure that ZANU-PF and the MDC share power equitably. But real power, control of the police, the army and the justice department, remains with ZANU-PF. There have been no successful prosecutions against ZANU-PF for the violence surrounding the 2008 elections. Conversely, there have been 26 cases against MDC MPs alone for charges as serious as high treason. The MDC wants Dr. Gono removed from the Reserve Bank, but he remains in office and his book on how to manage an economy remains on the shelves, albeit behind bars. The MDC wants their Deputy Agriculture Minister Roy Bennett sworn in, but he remains at home. But ZANU-PF in general and Patrick Chinamasa in particular have history with Bennett. We had been debating uh, the Stock Theft Amendment Bill in Parliament. And I had challenged the Minister of Justice and said to him, you know, people are starving, you want to put someone in jail for stealing a cockerel or a goat for nine years. I have personally have 820 head of cattle that you've stolen. Of which he responded uh, that I was the progeny of thieves and murderers and basically I snapped him. When did you say that? What about when did you say that? Which resulted in me being in prison for 15 months um, and sincere per persecution ever since then. Three days after the formation of the Government of National Unity, Bennett was again arrested, this time for treason. The case remains unresolved. Well, again, it's, it's Robert Mugabe who uh, rules supreme has said that when I am uh, freed of the criminal charges against me, he will swear me in. And that will mean that if it is delayed indefinitely, then you I will be never sworn. be sworn in, correct. And you feel that's what's at the heart of this? Absolutely. It's a, it's a personal issue that Mugabe's got against me. It's the fact that I'm white, I'm a commercial farmer, and possibly that um, I carry some more support of the people of Zimbabwe than he does. With the MDC unable to get its own deputy minister sworn in, it is hard to see what the unity government has achieved. Its members, however, insist that progress has been made. Our people had become scavengers in 2008, uh, but with what we did in a very short period of time in 2009, uh, we have rehabilitated uh, the lives of our people. Uh, as I speak now, it's a totally different place. It's almost like a, it's another country. The fact that uh, we managed to reduce inflation from 500 billion percent to annualized inflation of minus 7.7 7 percent in 2009 is a miracle. But power is the only currency that has held its value in Zimbabwe over the last 30 years. And the MDC's inability to protect its own supporters, whatever it might have achieved economically, 
suggests that the government of national unity has not been a good investment. Morgan Changrai was himself hospitalized in 2007, and in an incident in 2009, which remains the subject of intense speculation, his car was hit by a truck, killing his wife, Susan. This is not the first time the people of Zimbabwe have gone through such type of violence. And I can relate over the last 30 years. Our liberation struggle was not easy. It was violent, but eventually people had to sit down and say, what, do we, what is good for the country? And yes, I cannot bring back the loved ones, lost limb or the injuries. I've gone through the same process. But I, we must always uh, be motivated by the fact that uh, if we continue with the mindset of the past, of vengeance, of revenge and retribution, how is this laying the ground for reconstruction and development? But without justice and without an end to the abductions and abuse of ordinary Zimbabweans for their political beliefs, it is hard to see how there can be any development. For the moment, all these people have are each other with whom to share what they suffered. They took me away. They went me to a, a police station in Highlands. I was beaten till I even forgot my name, and I was taken to a mountain. They called this mountain a slaughtering place. At this slaughtering place, oh yeah. Very difficult, huh? Take your time. My friend tried to run away, and he was choked and killed while he still watching. I took a stone, a big stone. Straight away, I bashed one guy who was next to me, who was always monitoring me. And straight away, I made my way. And uh, you know, everyone was screaming, hey, catch him, catch him. They thought I went straight away into the rest of the mountain. But, but you I were went, hiding in the dirty water. I was water. just hiding in the uh, dead pool. Yeah, while at least I was hiding in the pool, there, there was something that was always you know, bashing on me, but I took my time to have a close check and hell. I saw it was a dead man. It may be the MDC's good fortune, however, that those with real power now have a new enemy, a fact the president went to great lengths to highlight at last year's party congress. The party is fighting itself. It's eating itself up. There are two major factions, one led by Joyce Mjuru and her husband, the retired general, um, and the other one led by uh, Emerson Mnangagwa. And each of these factions are struggling to succeed Mugabe. Um, what he didn't realize then was that there is now a faction, a third faction, which is led by him, which wants him and him alone to stay in power until he dies. What has potentially changed the political equation is the discovery of a massive, readily retrievable diamond find in eastern Zimbabwe. And with the potential for untold riches comes the prospect of ongoing conflict. Alluvial diamonds in Africa have never failed to cause a war. There are no exceptions. Any rich alluvial de diamond deposit found has caused a war. ACR's claim has been disputed by ZANU-PF, and despite a court order in its favor, ACR remains excluded from exploiting its own find as government troops have sealed off the area. Andrew Cranswick believes that the diamonds are being smuggled out of the country by the South African company brought in by the Ministry of Mines. Who are these benefiting? Not Zimbabweans. If there's 10 Zimbabweans benefiting from diamonds, I would say that's a lot. Well, let us assume that the elements that control the diamonds now don't believe in democracy and the rule of law. These people have the potential to either seize power or maintain power, depending on who we assume is involved. Part of the government of national unity and the GPA was, was necessitated by the fact that the economy was so crippled, that there was no alternate way of keeping going. Well, there is an alternate way now. No one can explain where the diamond profits are going. Yet the Justice Minister rejects any suggestion 
that politicians may be benefiting. I don't believe that there will be any factionalism around that resource. I can't see how it can be. There is no meeting that is taking place, as far as I know, at the party level to say who should be the investor. It's not, it's not, it's not true that they are politically motivated. I'm not aware. I deny it. If this money was going to the state, however, the finance minister might be expected to have some idea of the revenues. Do you know who is benefiting from the diamonds? I don't know, and, but certainly not the Minister of Finance, not the Zimbabwe Revenue Authority, not the government of Zimbabwe. Also, it could be you know, something that changes the political equation within Zimbabwe. Anyone who is able to control those resources will have a major say uh, in the unfolding uh, Zimbabwean political story. The generation that should be benefiting from the diamonds, but for the moment face only unemployment, remain cynical about the political process. Uh, we have an inclusive government on paper, but uh, as far as uh, violence is concerned, nothing much has changed. Who do you blame for the situation that Zimbabwe is in now? It is the government. Not necessarily the government of the day, but um, uh, the rulers uh, who, who began to rule Zimbabwe since 1980. I don't think now the issue, the blame, basically has to reside on the government, but on the people of Zimbabwe, whereby they are the ones who give the government the mandate. Well, we can't put the blame on our parents. The kind of ideology which was instilled uh, in, 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 our, in, in our parents, and the fact that these people are reminded of the war, but basically, it's, it's, it's some certain individuals in the government who've been running the government ever since we got independence up to today. Those are the people to be blamed. Oh, we got our independence in 1980, but oppression by a white person and oppression by a black, pres black person is always oppression. And therefore, we are still oppressed and we are still fighting for our freedom. But this realism is a long way from the attitudes of the independence generation who still run this country and who seem to live in a state of denial. Mugabe and ZANU-PF, who believe that they still have the support of the people. We had no misgivings about our victory, none. They will not allow this country to be run over, to be run by a puppet movement, no. The white farmers who believe that they will one day get their land back. I don't want to be given money. I want to go home. The new black farmers who believe that they can single-handedly resuscitate Zimbabwe's billion-dollar agriculture industry. As time goes on, we will gain the momentum and we will run. And surely we will do it. And the MDC, that ZANU will eventually give up power at the ballot box. And I can confidently sit in front of you today and tell you that ZANU PF are finished, Reggie. They're done. It's, it's just a matter of time and it's a matter of elections. Thank you.